Hey everyone, welcome to Meeple Bits. Thanks for joining me today. Today we're going to go through a setup and how to for the game Brass Lancashire. This version of Brass reprinted in 2018, designed by Martin Wallace, published by Roxley Games for two to four players with a playtime of listed at one to two hours, but realistically two hours or greater, especially at the four player count. So joining me as we go through this version of Brass Lancashire, and we're going to take a few turns as well, just to give you guys a, a general idea of how the game is played. Before we begin, let's take a look at all the different components that are going to come out during the course of play. Here we have the main play board. This side is for standard play. In the upper left corner is the draw pile, where you're going to place all of the location and industry cards. Below that is for the distant cotton market tiles, and then its subsequent discard pile. Below that is the value of the distant cotton market, and how much income you get for selling to the cotton market. The very bottom left is the turn order where you'll place your player portraits. In the upper right of the board is the coal and iron markets, and then just to the left of that is how much you're going to spend for canals, and rails when building one or two of them in the rail era. This side of the board, as indicated by the exclamation point in the upper left, is for the two-player variant. Everything else is the same. Let's take a moment to review the individual player boards and understand all the different uh, elements that are here. In the far left column, this is where you're going to put your cotton mill tiles. On the left of any of these locations is going to be its cost in pounds and resources and whether or not it can only be built in the canal era or the rail era. To the right of any given slot is its reward in victory points and income track. Next to the cotton mill, on the left and the right of each of these, as I mentioned, the same is going to be your sh uh, shipyards or your ports, then your ships, your ironworks, and your coal mines. Here's what the different tiles look like during the course of play. We have a portrait marker, which indicates the player color that you are, the canal and rail tokens, the cotton mills, two-sided, face up indicates that it's not yet sold, and then flipped over will tell you how much it's worth in link points, in victory points, and income marker. We have the shipyards, the ports, the ships, the coal mines, which on the front side indicate how many coal cubes they should receive, and on the flip side again, how many link points they're worth, victory points, as well as income progression, and then ironworks. Similar to the coal mines, this will also tell you how many initial cubes it gets when being built. And then these are your victory point uh, tokens, as well as your income tracker. Here we have the other elements that are going to come out in play, starting with the iron clays for the pounds. The distant cotton market face uh, two-sided, face up, and face down for their tiles. The Stevenson's marker. The two-sided cards, which will indicate what game, what the rounds are, what your actions are, and what to do in between the eras. And on its flip side, the disbursement of the cards and how many of each of them are available in the deck. And then above that, we have simple coal cubes, iron cubes, and then the distant cotton market tracker. These are the cards that are going to come out during play that you use to take your actions. In the top row, we have destination cards, and in the bottom row, we have the different industry cards. On the destination cards, in the left, right, and bottom center, it'll tell you where the location is, as well as in the far lower right is going to be how many player count this card is used for. On the industry card, in the top left and top right, shows you the type of industry with some artwork in the middle, and again in the lower right, how many player counts this card should be used for. Hey everyone, welcome to a setup of the game Brass Lancashire. To begin, 
place the main play board in the center of the table so all players can reach. Next, go through the deck of cards and remove any cards that do not match the player count that you're going to be using. So here, we're removing all player counts of four. In addition, remove all cards that have the exclamation point on them as that is part of the two player variant. Once you've removed all cards that do not match your player count, shuffle them and take them and put them in the upper left of the board. But first, take the number of cards equal to the number of players from the deck and put the Stevenson rocket tile over them and then place your shuffled deck on top. Next, take the distant cotton market tiles, removing any player count that does not match your player count. So in this three player game, we will remove all tiles that have a four count of the players. Shuffle them and put them in their correct location, followed by the distant cotton marker tile, or the, the piece, placed in the upper left of the board. Right there. Next, fill up the coal and iron markets by placing one coal and one iron cube on all empty spaces of those markets. The remaining cubes put them next to the board as a general supply. Then once all players that have selected a color decide who's going to go first in the game in whichever manner you choose. Take their victory point tokens and put them on the zero and then take their currency tracker token and put it next to the zero of the currency track. In addition, take their tile face up and put it in their player spot. Once all players have selected a color, all players should receive a player mat, 30 pounds from the bank, the tiles in their color, and then you'll want to set up the player board by putting all the cotton mills, ports, shipyards, ironworks, and coal mines in their respective areas. So tier 1, 2, 3, and 4 for each of them in their spots that they belong. Then off to the side, make sure you put your uh, rails, your two-sided rails and canal tiles, and then all players should receive eight cards from the play deck. So before we begin, let's look at two of the fundamental and critical elements to the game. That is your network and connected locations. Your network is any location that is adjacent to where you have a tile location, or you can connect it through a link. So right now, for yellow, this section is part of yellow's network, but, and as well as this would be part of yellow's network, so anything adjacent to where they have a location. However, yellow could not build a link tile here because this is not part of their network. Purple, however, would have the ability to build a canal here because it is part of their network much like this tile. Now as far as connections go, you must be connected to coal in order to use it, but you do not need to be connected to iron to use it. Example, if someone were to build anything on the board and right now the only access to coal is either through the coal market or through coal mines. A player must be connected directly in order to build it. So example, if let's say the cost of this were uh, coal, this could only be built because there is a direct link to the uh, coal mine. However, if a player needed to build, let's say, a shipyard, right now they could not because its cost is one coal and one iron. While the iron could be taken from here, there is no direct link to coal in order to build that. So those are kind of how the your network and connections work. So you can only build off of your network and then you must be connected to coal in order to use it. In addition, you must be connected to any ship yards in order to flip your tiles. So now you're ready to begin. 
The goal of the game is played out over two eras, the canal and the rail era, and the player who amasses the most victory points is the winner. Ties are broken to, by whoever is farthest on the income track. Secondary is whoever has the most money left in their supply. Each era is played out over a number of rounds, and that's going to continue until the entire deck and player hands are completely empty. That way, there are going to be 8, 9, or 10 rounds uh, in a 4, 3, or 2 player game, uh, and then during each round, players are going to take turns in order and according to however this is set up each round. So the player that spends the most money in each round becomes the last player for the next round. If there's any ties, the players would keep their positions and then just slide accordingly. On your turn, you're going to perform two actions, with the exception of round one of the Canal Era, in which you're only going to take one action to begin the game. All subsequent rounds will be performing two actions in turn order. And as the rules indicate, after you've taken your two actions, you will refill your hand up to eight if possible. Then determine the new turn order by determining who has spent the least or most amount of money, and then take income. And that's how a round is played. When performing actions, you're going to be able to build, which is placing one of your industry tiles onto the board, paying its appropriate cost, and then consuming any required coal or iron. Network allows you to expand your canals or rails, depending on which era by adding a link tile to the board that is a part of, as we covered a moment ago, your network. Develop, which allows you to remove two, one or two tiles from your player board to sort of develop um, those technologies by paying, the, uh, paying one cube in iron per action taken. So if you're developing out two tiles, you'll need to pay two iron. Sell action allows you to flip any built common or any built cotton mill tiles by selling that to either the distant cotton market or by flipping over a port tile and selling it there. Or take a loan. These loans can be taken in values of 10, 20, or 30 pounds. You're going to take it directly from the bank. And then you're going to move your income marker down however many segments the loan corresponds to. So 10 pounds is one, 30 pounds is three. When ending the canal era before moving to the rail era, you're gonna score all linked tiles, all flipped tiles, and then remove any tier one tiles from the play area. So example, in this setup, we would score five victory points one victory point and two victory points for the tiles being flipped. We would not score this because it is not flipped, but it would not be removed at the end of the cleanup. And then for the link, we would score one link plus one link. So two links for this one, but we would not score this shipyard because it is not linked. Now I understand that that's not a valid um, placement because it's not a part of any network and it wouldn't have gotten flipped, but bear with me for setup. So let's take a quick look at the build action. To do a build action, you're going to either discard a location card or an industry card from your hand. If using an industry card, it must match the industry that you're looking to build. If it's not the location, then you will not be able to build there unless it's a part of your network. So in this uh, setup, let's go ahead and discard Wigan and build a coal mine. We're now going to populate it with coal, like so. I'm going to pay its cost in accordance to the player board, which says that this may only be built in the canal era and it only costs me five pounds. So I'll take my five pounds, put it on my player marker so as to keep track of who has spent what during the course of play. And now I've successfully built my industry tile. The same would, go, the same would be true if I, were to want, if I were to build a cotton mill. I would need to discard the location 
or industry, but in this example, it would have to be the location because it's not yet part of my network because I do not have a canal tile. To perform a network action, similarly, discard any card from your hand. It doesn't need to be a location or industry. It could be either. And then place a canal connected to your network so it must branch from a location where you already have something existing. Pay its cost, in this case, three pounds, placing it on your portrait. Again, keeping track of who spent the most during the round. And now I've successfully built a canal. So I've used then the build action and the network action. When performing the develop action, you're going to remove any one or two tiles from your player mat. So let's say we wanted to remove these two ships so that we could develop and build the higher tier. I would develop, use the develop action by discarding one card from my hand. It can be location or industry. Remove the tiles and pay the cost in iron. That iron can be taken from anywhere on the board. Any location that has iron on the play area or from the iron market by paying its cost. So in this example, the only available iron is from the market, so I would need to spend two pounds because the first tier is one pound per iron. To perform a sell action, I'm going to sell off a cotton mill or my cotton either to a port tile or the distant market. I can sell to a port that has any that is not flipped but if it is unflipped, then I can still use the port to sell to the distant market. In addition, around the edges, so in um, destinations like Yorkshire over there and the Midlands down, down here, those are also connected to the distant markets, so you'll be able to trade your cotton there. So to do that action, I would again discard one card from my hand, can be any location or industry, any card and then I'm going to simply say I'm gonna sell this to this port and I can sell here because I'm connected to it it doesn't have to be a part of my network as long as I'm connected to it so I would then flip this tile I would choose to either sell it directly to this port allowing me to flip this tile or to the distant cotton market which would allow me to draw from the top of the distant cotton market deck placing it down, moving then the distant cotton top marker, and then selling it, and then going up that amount when selling. So here I would then go up the currency track five points, and if I sold it directly to this port, I would go up another three points on the currency track. If I sell it to the distant cotton market, let's see what that looks like. I would move the cotton market down one and I would still be able to get the three currency, but then this port remains unflipped. Now there's only a finite number of tiles in that marker, in that distant cotton market, so you have to choose wisely. And the last available action is taking a loan. So if I want to take a loan, I'll simply discard any card from my hand and then take 10 20 or 30 pounds. So here I would take, let's say, 30 pounds and then move my marker, my currency marker, down three units on the track. And so the loan action is complete, but I'm 30 pounds richer. Play will continue uh, throughout the canal era until all cards from this deck revealing the Stevenson rocket are shown and all cards are used from the player's hands. So we'll end the canal era. You'll handle your scoring, then you'll handle cleanup of any tier one tiles and move into the rail era. In the rail era, you're going to do the same thing. Shuffle the deck of cards, except this time, you're going to turn the marker over, showing the Rothschild side. And under it, instead of placing only one, you're going to place two cards per player. 
So in a three-player game, you would put six cards underneath this tile, putting all other cards on top, and then deal out again eight cards per player. Once the game is ended, where all players have finished through the deck of cards for the rail era, you're going to handle scoring in the same way. Score all flipped industry tiles, score all rail links where industry tiles are connected that are flipped, but additionally, you're going to perform one additional scoring event, which is money. You're going to score one victory point for every 10 pounds a player has at the end of the era. And then you're going to advance or crawl along the victory point track, and the player with the most score wins. So that's going to do it for this one, everyone. Uh, I hope you found this helpful. Um, if you have any questions, I'm going to kind of tear down the uh, board. It's pretty massive. Uh, and stay tuned for my afterthoughts. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that setup and how-to for the game Brass Lancashire. So let's go ahead and jump into my thoughts. Um, this one, really solid game. Now, as someone who has not played the original Prince of Brass or its original form, I can't really speak too much to how this one differs or is better. Only I can give you the facts that it is, I guess, as close to the original iteration as possible with rules that are identical to uh, the original elements as well as the more streamlined rules published by Roxley. So I am a huge fan, though, of whatever changes were made um, in, in this version. The components of the game itself are fantastic. They are absolutely incredible. The chit pieces are even though they are chits, and I'm not usually a huge fan of them, but the tiles are really well, really well made. The iron clays for the currency, uh, I find myself uh, annoyingly playing with them a bit too much, but really solid and really well done. The insert, as you guys know, I'm a huge fan of game inserts, and this one is mostly well thought out, so no, no major qualms there. The game itself has some really solid core mechanics and stratagems so that when you're trying to decide on when to take out that loan, um, when the best time to do so is. In addition, you really got to think and figure out what's the best strategy of selling um, either your cotton to the um, to the overseas market or selling your cotton to a shipyard that might actually help another player in flipping their tiles. So the decision making is really good. In addition, it's cutthroat. And that's a good thing for this type of game because, you know, you're out to, to obviously you're out to win, but with the way the mechanics work, um, you could try to plan your turn, you know, two, three in advance. Like, all right, you know, on this one, I'm going to do these two turns. And on the next one, I've got this city and then I've got, you know, this industry card. So I'm going to try to use them in this order. And then by the time it comes back around to you, um, you're, the very next player could have already blocked what you were looking to accomplish. And I love that. So the randomness that the cards kind of generate and then building a strategy around sort of the hand that you're dealt, for lack of a better phrase, is really good. Why is Brass Lancashire a game that you should add to your collection? Well, if you know the original and you're a fan of it, then this is absolutely for you. The artwork is absolutely gorgeous. And, you know, I've pulled up, you know, shots of the original brass. And I'll tell you what, um, the artwork on that one, I would have kept walking. It doesn't um, appeal to me. It didn't draw me in whatsoever. But when I originally kickstarted this game, um, it was the artwork that really kind of captured me and drug me in. I was like, wow, that looks like a really interesting game. So if you're a fan, though, of games that use their setting really well um, with solid uh, mechanics, then this is absolutely one for you because you're really trying to control areas while managing your own uh, economy and figuring out when is going to be the best time to get your tiles flipped. Why is this a game that you may not want to add to your collection? Well, it is a bit on the longer side, at least every time that we've played it. And 
that could turn some people off because if you're, you know, usually like me, you need to get a game in in one or two hours. This one has never for us gone less than two hours. So if you are looking for a shorter game, this is definitely not going to be for you. It is also kind of an expensive game. So uh, it's it's a bit on the pricey side. Now, it's no, it's no Gloomhaven um, price point, but um, it's high up there. So keep that in mind when you're exploring um, this version or the other one, which I'll, I'll be reviewing soon enough, Brass uh, Birmingham. So you may not also want to add this to your collection, though, again, if you're one of the friendly type of players, because all too often when we play this game, you know, um, one of my, the table mates might be planning a strategy to, you know, get one of their uh, shipyards flipped or one of their ports flipped. And then, um, you know, the player right in front of them will go ahead and sell their cotton into that port. Now, it does get flipped, but they really needed that so that they could flip their own cotton. So those types of mechanics could be a huge turnoff for players, especially if you like to strategize without any outside influence. So those are kind of my takes on, on this version of Brass. Again, I haven't played the original, um, so I can't necessarily compare it to the original only in the form of the artwork, which the original, very blah to me. This one, really, I don't know. It's just, I was a huge fan. So I, I, I can't say too much um, great things about this one, guys. Add it to your collection. It's really a good game. Um, I'll also be doing a comparison between um, Lancashire and Birmingham. So uh, stay tuned for that one as well and check it out so that you could figure out if you can only pick one or the other, which one might be better for you. So if you have any comments about this game, any questions about how it's played, please leave a comment down below. Happy to help out as best as I can. If you've enjoyed the content, Feel free to leave a like and subscribe. Really appreciate the support. Until next time, guys. Thanks so much for watching.